Well, this morning you are sitting in a Baptist church building, listening to a Baptist preacher, having seen four baptisms, and now you're going to hear a message about baptism. So you should be thoroughly baptized by the time you leave this place today. We are, we're by heritage and conviction, Baptist. And so, therefore, by definition, you would think that we would place a certain centrality on the idea of baptism. But with great irony, as baptistic as all of this may sound on the surface, the real concern this morning is that the meaning and purpose, biblically, of baptism in our churches is being greatly eroded and lost. Even more in many, even Baptist churches, but in general evangelical churches, baptism is more and more being trivialized in churches. Now this is going to certainly be review for many of you. But it is important from time to time to remind ourselves of why we observe the ordinances that we do of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And it's important to be reminded from Scripture. Because it's from Scripture that we derive the true meaning of something, not by what we see happening in the culture related to that something. Many churches, baptism is trivialized, as I've already mentioned. I heard not long ago of one church in its children's ministry area constructed a baptistry in the shape of a fire engine, and every time a child was baptized, confetti cannons would explode in celebration of this baptism that I would say was really not a baptism at all. And then, even if we're not guilty, because that's, Uh, Granted, that's the exception rather than the rule. I don't know of many fire engine baptistries. But even if we don't trivialize it, I think we relegate baptism to such a low priority and meaning in the life of the church that it's just one right, R-I-T-E, one activity that we do alongside many activities. I mean, after all, we do baby dedications, and we do potlucks, and we do offerings, and we do cantatas, and a number of other good things. Oh, and we do baptism, too. I mean, can you just see that would fit into a conversation? You know, we had groups, teams, thankfully, uh, wonderfully yesterday went out, you know, to talk to the neighbors in the neighborhood and to, to share the gospel with them and, and, and hopefully by opportunity to invite them to our church. Can you imagine a conversation that would go something like that? And it come, come to Oak Crest because we have a lot of different things. We've got, we've got children's things and youth things and music things. And we eat meals and we have sermons and we sing songs and we do baptisms. And we do this and we do that. And baptism is just one in a long line of really good and noble things we do as a church. I think if we, if we think of baptism in that way... We diminish baptism to kind of a Christian bar mitzvah. A kind of a a Christian uh, coming of age ceremony. Where everybody knows that you just reach a certain age in childhood and you just get baptized. It's what Baptists do. Sadly, it's a misunderstanding of the biblical nature of baptism because baptism is not a rite of passage. It's not a coming-of-age ritual. It is the gospel proclaimed. Join me in Romans chapter 6 as we look at the first 11 verses. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Follow along as I read these 11 verses in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with Him. We'll also live with Him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So the first couple of verses set the stage, kind of set the the setting for us. So look at what he says in verse 1. What shall we say then? Now you remember, he's been... He has been making a theological argument about the nature of sin way since chapter 1. He's talked about sin. He's talked about its devastating effects. He's talked about the reality that we are condemned by the law of God in our sinfulness. He's talked about the fact that our our faith does not, or our, our goodness, our good works of the law are not what saves us, but faith is what saves us. He's talked about the fact that we're justified by faith. He's talked about the fact that we have now peace with God through our faith in Christ. He's compared and contrasted those who are in Adam with those who are in Christ. That in Adam all are dead and in Christ all are made alive who are in Christ. And now then, he's basically asking a rhetorical question to his reader, to his hearer, in light of that fact... What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now think about what he's saying here. He has been making this case, this rock-solid theological case that you cannot earn salvation. You can never be good enough to please God. That the only way we please God is through faith. Faith in Christ alone. It is faith that justifies It's by God's grace. Well, now, humanly speaking, carry that out logically. Huh. So the more sin in our life, the more glorious it is when God saves me. Now, there's some truth in that. As with most lies, they are in some way a half-truth, right? I mean, you think about it. Who, Who, from a human perspective seems like a more miraculous salvation. You know, someone who's raised in a Christian home and comes to Christ when they're nine? Or, you know, the, 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 the murdering, thieving, adulterous, no good prison inmate who comes to Christ in a jail cell. Well, obviously there's a difference from a human perspective anyway. This is what Paul's kind of peeling back the layers on. He's saying, so then if that's true, and God is in the business of saving, right? Voltaire said, God saves. It's his business. If God's in the business of saving, more sin equals more forgiveness. More forgiveness means more glory to God. Let's sin more. Or at minimum, it doesn't matter how much we sin. So Paul is addressing the ongoing question of how the gospel impacts our behavior and our attitude. It's an important important question not only in Paul's day, but in our day. How does the grace of the gospel intersect the demands of the law? As I mentioned to you in the past, there exists a dangerous belief today, as in Paul's day, that is a kind of, and here's a big word, and I use it a lot, and eventually uh, you'll just start saying it in your sleep, as I say it enough, antinomianism. Antinomianism is that idea that the law no longer matters. 
in light of the grace of the New Testament, the law is completely, not, not merely fulfilled, that's true, but it's trashed, it's, it's useless, it has no purpose whatsoever in the life of the believer. And one, and now, uh, listen, we could spend four hours talking about the divergent strains of antinomianism that have occurred over the centuries since the time of Christ. Um, but one manifestation of this is what's called perfectionism. And perfectionism is the idea that in Christ... We are justified before the Father, right? That's true enough, right? So when he sees us, he sees Christ. And therefore, not guilty. Perfectionism teaches that God already sees us as perfect because of our salvation in Jesus. Therefore, what we actually do is of little consequence because we're already perfect in God's eyes through Christ. You see how logically that plays out? You see how potentially that's what this rhetorical question is answering in verses 1 and 2? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? More grace covers more sin, more glory? And of course, we don't have to look very far to see Paul's response. By no means. It's very difficult to translate the emphasis and the stress that Paul makes in that phrase. Best we can do is that exclamation point, at least in the ESV, there's an exclamation point there. By no means. And Paul's saying, how could you arrive at such a conclusion? How could you possibly come to that conclusion based on everything I've said about the nature of the gospel and the nature of faith and so forth? So the idea that if we're in Christ, our sin is forgiven and the law is fulfilled, then we're perfect regardless of what we actually do or how we actually live is addressed by Paul in terms of by no means. And then he answers further, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Paul says sin and new life in Christ go together like oil and water. That, that does not mix. It is just never going to mesh well. And so any theology that you scheme in your mind in which you have, can be at peace in the midst of your sinfulness is not a biblical theology. It's not a biblical truth. And this is the very thing that Paul's addressing and his answer is our focus this morning. Because, now that's kind of the, the setting, right? What's the problem? You're in Christ, therefore put away sin. Now, you would never think, at least I wouldn't, that the best explanation of why this is true would be baptism. And yet it is. It's almost as if Paul's saying, if you truly understood the nature of baptism, you wouldn't even ask such a foolish question. Because notice his answer regarding baptism. His answer is our focus this morning. So the, the, the first thing that we see here is, according to verses 2 through 4, in Christ we died to sin. Okay, look at verses 2 through 4 again. Verse 2, the second half. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You see what Paul, Paul's saying there? What applies to Christ applies to you. So a, few, a little bit earlier, just reconfirming with Quinn, talking to him once again about the significance of, of baptism and wanting to emphasize what I'm going to emphasize with you, that it's not like a big bathtub. We're not washing our sins away. Nothing like that. And he said it so beautifully and so eloquently. He said, he said, it's like I'm being put in the tomb 
It's like Quinn's going into the tomb. I said, that's it. That's precisely, that is precisely the point of baptism. We died to sin. We died in Christ. And so Paul lays a foundation. Sin exists. It's out there. And you've died to it, believer. When you came into relationship with Jesus Christ, your relationship to sin changed. No longer living to sin, but living to Christ. Oh, it was so beautiful. I never thought a a Wesley brother could, could so beautifully articulate the biblical truth of salvation as what we have in verse 3 of And Can It Be? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. That's the power, that's the penetrating spirit of God through the gospel. Thy eye diffused a penetrating ray. Notice what happened. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That's the gospel, friends. You know I tease in regard to the Wesleys, but when it comes to biblical truth, it's clear regarding salvation that there is a distinct difference between life before Christ and life after Christ. It's just completely changed. We're dead to sin now. We're living to Christ. And Paul explains all of this through baptism. What is baptism? Let's think about that just for a moment. And in order for us to get to what Paul is really getting at in this passage, we really need some broader background making the case for what I believe is is the biblical pattern of believer's baptism. Contrary to what you may know as pedo-baptism or infant baptism. Because if it is true what he says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? The old has gone, the new has come. If that is a true representation of what happens and what is symbolized in baptism, how can that be applied in any realistic way to infants? I can't can't see that that would be the case at all. But don't take it from me. Let's look at what Scripture says. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to build a case, hopefully, that will be compelling biblically to you. I don't necessarily care that it is eloquently compelling. I care that it is biblically compelling. Matthew 12, verse 38. Once again, the scribes and the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus. And look at what they say. Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Doesn't that just send chills down your spine? The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So they're saying, in essence, prove to us that you are God. Do something fancy, Jesus. Show us a sign. Do something that will take our breath away. We'll not be satisfied with anything less than an indisputable, undeniable sign of divinity. And he, Jesus says, well, let me grab my bag of tricks then. Let me think of a real 
do is he, he doesn't do anything at all. But he speaks about Jonah. A rather obscure Old Testament prophet. I mean obscure in the sense of compared to, for example, Isaiah or Jeremiah or even Ezekiel. Rather obscure. And he compares Jonah with the only sign that they'll be given. Now listen to this. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So notice what's happening. Jonah was in the grave of the belly of the big fish for three days. Jesus said, tear down this temple, I will rebuild it in three days, in which he was speaking of himself and his own death. So Jesus dies and rises on the third day. He's saying, the only sign you'll be given is the sign of Jonah. Now hold with me. Jonah, if you'll remember, it's, it's something is going on in the story of Jonah beyond a fish. Because the fish is just a means to the end that God is accomplishing in Jonah's life. You remember Jonah? Before I tell you more about Jonah, look at what Jesus says in this verse again, though. Because it doesn't end with that. Jonah was in three days, I'm in three days. That's the, that's the comparison. It's more than that. Because then he says, the men of Nineveh, will rise up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. He doesn't merely leave the comparison at himself and Jonah, just like Jonah was in the whale three days, I'll be in the earth three days. Now he brings in this element of judgment. And the people that Jonah preached to in Nineveh repented, and they will rise up in judgment against these who are questioning and condemning Jesus in the last day. Now, you've got to hold tight just for a minute for all this to kind of gel together. Remember the story. Jonah rebelled. The people of his land, Israel, would have hated the Ninevites. I mean, they were the Assyrians, for goodness sake. they, They were the oppressor. They were the enemy in every respect. God's judgment on Jonah caught up with him on the sea. Remember on the boat, the storm, and Jonah's sleeping. And the men must respond because nature is boiling around them. The men on the boat, right? They know something's wrong because this is a storm unlike anything they've ever seen. And attention is directed at Jonah. Now, in the book of Jonah, we have something fairly incredible that takes place. If you will find your way to the book of Jonah, I would like to share with you what happens. In Jonah chapter 2, and I think I can find it with you, but if not, we'll just stay over a little longer until I can... Okay, here it is. Jonah chapter 2. Okay, now remember the story. Jonah is thrown into the sea by the sailors on the boat. He tells them, pick me up, hurl me into the sea... The sea will quiet down. That's, I'm here. This storm's happening because of me. But then look at what chapter 2 says, because this is the real heart of the book of Jonah. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried. Now what, what is Sheol? The place for the dead. From the midst of death I cried out. Some people believe Jonah actually died in the belly of the fish, even more pointing to the resurrection idea uh, that comes with Jesus. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. And all your waves and your billows passed over me. And then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple." And the waters closed in over me to take my life. And the deep, you see this desperation that he's using here? The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. You see that language? Listen to it again. I went down to the land 
whose bars closed upon me forever. That is death. Yet you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. Whether he actually died or not is beside the point. He was at the point of death from his perspective. That's what's important. Verse 7, when, I was, when life was fading away, I remember the Lord. And my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But with, I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What have I vowed I will pay? Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Now, I want you to think about what we just read there and how this all fits in with this idea of Jesus, judgment, Jonah, the whale, everything fits together. In the Old Testament, specifically in the book of Jonah, water is the instrument of God's wrath. Water is the instrument of God's righteous judgment. Can you think of other examples? Noah's ark, the flood, right? Judgment comes to all of those who are outside the ark. If you're in the ark, you're safe. If you're outside the ark, you're judged. And the means of judgment is a drowning flood. What about the exodus? Pharaoh's army is in pursuit. And the waters engulf Pharaoh's army. Jonah is in rebellion. The waters engulf Jonah. Throughout the Old Testament, water is a means of God simultaneously judging and saving His people. So you notice that. Consistently, God both saves, saves His people through judgment. We never think about it that way from our perspective, but the Scripture always does. God saves through judgment. God's judgment poured out on Jesus is why you sit here saved today. God's judgment poured out on Egypt is why Israel was a nation at all. God saves through judgment. Now, you're thinking at this point, okay, that's in, that's that's. Fair enough, how does that have anything to do with baptism? And I would say it has everything to do with baptism. Listen to, um, I think probably uh, the one who has helped me on this issue more than anybody else that has uh, written beautifully about it is uh, Russell Moore. He says it this way. Here's a quote from him uh, regarding baptism and what I've been talking about. You are delivered through baptism. Not that baptism is saving you. It's not washing away dirt from the flesh. When we are baptizing, listen to this, when we are baptizing, we are saying that we believe as a church that this man, that this woman, is part of an old creation that has been judged in Christ. That we are confessing that this person is worthy of death. And we join in confessing his worthiness of death. Now we don't... That is a different picture from fire engines and confetti cannons. Because what you just did, whether you realized it or not, is you made a a corporate confession as the church of Jesus Christ for all four of those baptismal candidates. According to what we understand, that in Christ we died to sin, that our sin is deserving of death, you looked at those candidates. And rather than how we would be inclined to look at it, I want to encourage you to think about it differently in the future. Because what we're inclined to think of is Quinn is so cute up there. Oh. I want you to think about it more of, Quinn, you are condemned to death because of your sinfulness. Paul Steele, you are condemned to death because of your sinfulness. Dustin and Carol Boyd, you are condemned to death 
because of your sinfulness. But here's the glorious truth of the gospel. They are buried with Christ in baptism. They died with Christ. See, this is how the picture starts to come complete. When we stand in the waters of baptism, we're saying, that is, this is my public execution. But not our death. Jesus' death. Romans chapter 6, same, same passage that we've been looking at. Look again. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. We just said this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I say it every time I baptize anybody and have for years. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. It is a symbol, not of a giant bathtub but a giant execution chamber where we die with Christ. But the great news is the congregation says you are deserving of death, baptismal candidate, but Christ has paid the price. Christ has paid the penalty. The judgment has already been executed in Christ. The person is in Christ, buried in the waters of the wrath of God. Baptism is our evidence of our death with Christ. Think about the meaning of baptism. Death is a, a, the baptism is a symbol of a substitution. Why does Paul use this baptismal imagery? Because what the believer says in baptism is the answer to the question about sin. Remember where we started? Well, then should I go on sinning so that... God might be more glorified through His gracious forgiveness? He answers the question. Verse 2, Jesus' death in the waters of judgment is our death. He's your substitute. You're dead to sin. How could you go on living in sin? And by the way, not only is the meaning of baptism as substitution important, the mode of baptism is important. Some of our brothers and sisters uh, would potentially disagree with this, arguing more for an idea about pouring or sprinkling or whatever the case may be, where we practice full immersion. Why is immersion important? Well, that's the point. It's, it holds to this imagery, remember? If that's the execution chamber, just think about it. I mean, from a physical, scientific perspective, if you were held under that water for an extended period of time, you die. In those moments that those candidates are beneath the water, symbolically, but in another way, literally, at least in a very brief moment, they are dying. They have no access to air. They are totally submerged. They're immersed under the water. They're in the tomb. They're dead, but they're raised to new life. See, even immersion itself makes, paints this picture. And not only that, there's a symbol in the idea that as I raise them, or as the, as the minister raises the candidate out of the water, it's showing they're dependent upon someone else to pull them up out of the water. Jonah, again, what is his prayer from the belly of the fish? I need you, God, You're the only one that can save me. He is totally and wholly dependent upon God. So in baptism, the church, it's as much about the church as it is about the candidate himself or herself. The church is boldly, loudly demonstrating a sign and an announcement of the power of the gospel and the presence of the death and resurrection of Christ in the life of this person being baptized. Not that they're saved in the baptism. God forbid we would leave here thinking that. But that the, that the baptism is the symbol of what has happened spiritually in the life of the person. And now we begin to see why to trivialize this is so wrong. The old order has gone. The new has come. See, our old condition was with 
with Christ on the cross. Look at verse 6, skipping ahead just a little bit in chapter 6. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. The old order is done away with through our faith in Christ. The old is destroyed. The judgment is accomplished. Sin is crucified. So we sing the old spiritual, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? If you're a believer, the answer must be absolutely yes. Because I died with Christ. And that was symbolized in my baptism. This is the key to dying to sin. When an employee dies, he ceases to be employed, right? When a slave dies, he ceases to be a slave. In your old, unregenerate state, you were a slave to sin. Now you're dead. You're no longer in slavery and bondage to sin anymore. You were crucified with Christ. We were in Adam, now we're in Christ. And that's what we're preaching in baptism. I told these candidates that what they would do this morning would preach a far more profound sermon than I could ever preach, or anyone could ever preach. Because they are demonstrating the gospel. I was a sinner, but I died to Christ, and He brought me to life. I was in slavery to sin, and now I'm set free. The chains fell off, and I followed Christ. Baptism shows that we understand the judgment and the justice of God. It's not that we die to our sin necessarily, but we assume Christ's death for our sin. We're preaching the righteousness of God. We're pleading with people to repent, confessing that we deserve death just as they deserve death. We are dying men, preaching to dying men, as one has said it. One more quote from Russell Moore, helpful at this point. Baptism is not merely the individual saying. Now listen to this. is not merely the individual saying, I want to show you something that has happened to me. Baptism is the church of Jesus Christ proclaiming through the discipline of that church that we confess that this one has been united with Christ in judgment, in death, crucifixion, burial, resurrection from the dead. That is a powerful statement. It is identification with the covenant body. It's not a spectator sport. And it requires a certain level of grasp of the essential principles. It is not necessary that a baptismal candidate be able to articulate these things in the way that I am articulating them right now, or hopefully am articulating them. But it is certainly necessary that a candidate have an understanding of the nature of substitution, of penalty, of righteousness, of, of repentance, true repentance. That they've had opportunity to demonstrate that repentance. Because this is a serious, serious ordinance. Lastly, in Christ we're alive to God. Just as we close together the last few verses, actually the second half of verse 4, just as in Christ we were raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Verse 5, For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be reunited in a resurrection like His. What about verse 8? Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Resurrection. Verse 9, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Our hope and our life is in the resurrection of Christ. And connection between these ideas is, is seen in, in Galatians 2.20, right? I am crucified with Christ and therefore I no longer live. But Christ lives through me. The life I live in the body, I live not of myself. 
but of the one who loved him and gave himself for me? That's the answer to the rhetorical question of Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Shall we go on sinning? No, because I'm crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives through me. How could I possibly entertain the thought of continuingly, knowingly in blatant sinful rebellion? It's unthinkable. At the resurrection, death and sin no longer control Christ. He had won the victory. And if then, logically follow, if Christ is our substitution, what applies to Christ applies to us, guess what? We're alive. We're alive spiritually, and we are guaranteed absolutely to be alive spirit, uh, physically after the resurrection. Why? Because we're Christ. He is our identity. What applies to him applies to us. Happened to me in marriage, right? One day I was Blaine Craig, and I was dating this young lady named Sarah Manus. But then the next day we were married, and all of a sudden she had my name. And now she was Sarah Craig. You think about the implications of that. That means she can put my name on a check. My name is on a card that I may not even be using. You see the implication? What applies to her applies to me. When you take a person's name in a covenant-binding relationship like marriage, and what is the gospel relationship with Christ except Christ's marriage to his bride, the church? And so, if he's victorious over sin, so are we. We've conquered sin and death through the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ. And God sees us through Christ. So in light of all of this, I just hope that you'll be reminded, encouraged, comforted, and challenged that when we baptize a new believer, we are announcing to the great hatred disdain and rage of the kingdom of darkness that the waters of judgment will one day overtake them but that this one Dustin and Kara Boyd Paul Steele Quinn Douglas these are outside the dominion of that kingdom because through faith in Christ they have already passed through the judgment and now they are safe in Christ do you see the weight of your responsibility in affirming not in a cavalier attitude that baptismal candidates have an adequate and accurate Understanding, not having a false understanding of these things is my responsibility as a pastor, as an elder. It's your responsibility as a church that we not take these things lightly. Just because someone walks down an aisle and check marks a box does not necessarily mean that we can say with great confidence that they have passed through the waters of judgment with Christ and have risen victoriously in Him. It takes, it takes careful thought. So I challenge you to join me in that as we take very seriously the salvation of our friends, our neighbors, our children, that we would know the kind of statement that they're making. I have been buried with Christ in baptism, and therefore I no longer live. Christ lives through me. I wonder, have you ever followed the Lord in baptism? Maybe, maybe your testimony is similar to Paul's, where you've been a believer for some time, but never actually followed the Lord in believer's baptism. It's not about the baptism. It's about what you're pointing to through the symbol of baptism. One more time. 
long my imprisoned spirit lay. Fast bound in sin and nature's night. Captive to sin and death. A hostage to emotions and grudges and anger and revenge. And seeking selfish ambition and striving for corporate or professional advancement. Or talking about uh, failed relationships or or trying to fill desires through um, adverse means like drugs or alcohol or illicit relationships or who knows. But whatever you fill in the blank, it fits. Your imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. But then, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I wonder if the very simple gospel you've heard this morning is the truth that the Holy Spirit has used to just open your eyes. Just as Wesley describes here. Opens your eyes to the truth of the gospel in a way that you had not understood before. And you see Christ in all of his glory and he is indeed irresistible to you. Not in a coercive sense, but you long for him. You long to know Him and embrace Him. Well, that's the next word. I woke. It's like the prodigal son who, when he's in the pig pit, says, I came to my senses. There was a dawning moment. I realized how foolish I had been. I once was blind, but now I see. He says, I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. I didn't pry them open. I didn't do a Houdini act and get out. Through the gifts of faith and repentance, they fell off. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Would you stand with me? Father, I pray that if there be one in this congregation... that does not know Jesus, that for the glory of your own name, that you would do a miraculous work in their heart this morning. Change them. In Jesus' name, amen. Sinner, come to Jesus.